turn to our loving Heavenly Father and let's turn to him in prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the joy of this time of Advent as we remember again the coming of our Saviour. Thank you for that babe born in Bethlehem that is now the Lord of history. And Father, as we think about the coming of the Lord Jesus, we are filled with wonder that that baby in the manger was truly God with us. The one who flung stars into space was the one who came to live among us, who came uh, to live amongst those of us he's created, to come into our world with all of its mess and all of our sin, not to condemn us, but to save us. And Father, we thank you so much as we meet this morning for the Lord Jesus. Thank you for your great love to each one of us in sending him. Father, we thank you for that great love that you set upon us even before the creation of the world. We thank you for that great plan of salvation. And Father, we thank you Uh, for your faithfulness. Thank you for the way that we can depend upon you day by day, that you do not change. We thank you that that love that you set upon us before the creation of the world is an everlasting love. It's a love that will never let us down. It's a love that we can know will last for all eternity. Father, we... We praise and thank you uh, this morning for your great compassion on us too. Lord, we we recognize that we don't deserve your love. But Father, we thank you that you are a God who does not treat us as our sins deserve. And Father, uh, we thank you that uh, we can be here this morning. We thank you for each person and for each family represented here. And Father, we thank you that you know us and you know all about us. And we thank you that you care for us. And Father, we pray that as we meet this morning, that you would speak to each one of us and that you would encourage us and help us, we pray. And Father, as we meet, we pray that we too would encourage one another. Father, please help us to encourage one another to love and trust the Lord Jesus day by day. And Father, we pray that you'd help us to spur one another on, even as we meet and as we talk afterwards, that you would help us to spur one another on to love and good deeds. Heavenly Father, we want to remember also this morning those who are not able to be with us this morning. Father, we think of some perhaps because of illness or because of age or because of their circumstances are not able to meet with us. Father, we pray that they would know your presence in a very special way this morning and that they would know your love 
and your guidance and help in their lives. This morning we pray. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's, uh, it's great to see uh, some younger ones uh, amongst us this morning. And um, I think I've been coming for a, a number of times to you here. And, and in the past, I've discovered a number of things about uh, you here at Potton. I've discovered that you are very good at uh, identifying all sorts of pictures, particularly those that have got Star Wars characters in them. <laughs> I've discovered that you're quite good at solving puzzles. You know a lot about the Easter story. And like all good folks of Bedfordshire, you prefer Brussels sprouts to chocolate. <laughs> Although maybe you've discovered my memory is not as good as it used to be. Um, well, today I've got a different challenge for you. No, no pictures, okay, children? No pictures this time. I've got some things for you to listen to. And I want you to tell me, when you listen, you're going to hear some voices. I want you to tell me whose voice it is. Now, I always get nervous about this because this relies on technology. And uh, if you know anything about technology, you'll know not to rely upon it. But here we go. Here's your first, uh, first one. I'll try and... Let's see if this works. Here we go. Here we go. Nice, easy one to start with. Okay. Here we go. See if you can tell me who this is. And achievements. I am so inexpressibly proud. Can you hear that? Have prospered and flourished. Our values have remained and must remain constant. Who do we think the that is? Yes. King Charles. Brilliant. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Okay. Well, let's try. Let's try this one. Okay. This is a bit more tricky one. I'm very consistent in that I like the idea of empowering people. But I recognise people have to be led and people have to be guided and any ideas to the leader for answers. Sorry for the painful for, memory um, of last night. You know, particularly <laughs> in the moments of pressure, where are we heading? Um, Who is it? Who do we think? It's Gareth Southgate, the England manager. Yes, that was before. Yes, last night. Here we go. Okay, let's have a let's have another. This one is for the younger children. Maybe. I'll be impressed if anybody over 50 knows this because I wouldn't have known it. But uh, here we go. Here we are. Oh, what a great idea. Chase, get to the top of the clock tower. We're going to make Big Benji ring through your dragon mail. Eh, eh, the, yes? Paw Patrol. And who is it? Ryder. Excellent. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. And of course, I know that all of you over 50s all knew that one. You all got that one. Okay. And uh, excellent, excellent, excellent. So one final one. One final one. Here we go. Our long-awaited meeting has come at last. Who is that? Sorry? Darth Vader. Darth Vader. Excellent. Very good. Excellent. Now, you are very good at recognizing those voices. You are very, very good. You, you, you heard their voices and you recognize them. And that uh, reminds me of, uh, of something that Jesus uh, once said. And perhaps we could have it up on the slide. Let's see how this works. Oh, look, that's very small, isn't it? Oh, goodness. This is going to be an eyesight test for you. But this is what Jesus once said. He said, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep, what do the sheep do? They listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him. Why do they follow him? Because they know 
his voice. Because they know his voice. And Jesus, in that same passage, went on to say that actually he is that shepherd. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Did you notice that just as uh, you recognise those voices, so Jesus said that sheep that belong to a shepherd recognise his voice because they recognise his voice when he calls their name and they follow him. And Jesus said, he is just like the shepherd. And he is the good shepherd. So that those who trust and believe in him also, like the sheep, listen to his voice. And when they recognise it, they follow what he says to them. Now there's some voices that we listen to, you wouldn't want to follow them, would you? I don't know if Darth Vader said to you, would you come over here? I don't think I'd want to follow and what Darth Vader was saying. But Jesus is the one who we can trust. He is the good shepherd. We, we hear lots of voices, lots of people telling us things. But the one above all that we can trust is the Lord Jesus. He loves us and he wants us to know him and to follow him. Because there is no one better in the whole world to listen to and to follow. Well, we are going to sing a song now that speaks about following the Lord Jesus. So let's, as the music starts, let's stand and sing together.
going to uh, read from the Bible now, and we're going to read uh, from Micah 5, and I think we'll just read uh, the first uh, six verses of Micah chapter 5. So if you do have a Bible, this is where it gets much easier if you use a, uh, an electronic device, because it's much easier to find Micah, but if you've got a uh, an actual Bible, then it's between Jonah and Nahum. Page 778. Brilliant. Seven, page 778 in the church Bibles. Thank you. That's great. Micah chapter 5, verse 1. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, for you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up, until the time when she who is in labour has given birth, then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. When the, Assyrians come, when the Assyrian comes into our land and treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princes of men. They shall shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. And he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and treads within our border. May God bless the reading of his word to us. Uh, a little bit, in a few minutes, we will be uh, looking at that passage. But before we, we do that, uh, let's uh, turn once more to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we... Thank you that you are good. Uh, we thank you for that reminder of that you, the Lord Jesus is our good shepherd. Uh, we thank you for the way that you provide for us and care for us. And yet, Father, we recognize that though you are good and you are beautiful in all your ways, that so all your ways are right, that so often we fail and we don't do the things that we know we should do. We don't love you as we ought to. And Father, as we meet this morning, we are conscious of our own sinfulness, our own waywardness. And Father, we confess that even in this past week, there have been times when we have given little or no thought to you. There have been times when we've lived in a, a selfish way. You know, we've done things and said things and thought things that were not right. Things that do not please you. But Father, as we come and we confess our sins, we thank you that you are a pardoning God. We thank you for the Lord Jesus who died in our place to take away our sins. We thank you that there is forgiveness as we confess our sins and trust in you. Heavenly Father, we are also conscious that we live in a needy world. Father, this morning we pray for those in, in places where there is conflict and turmoil. Father, again, we would raise up to you, the people of Ukraine. Father, we think, as we feel the cold at this time, we think of them, many without electricity or power and freezing temperatures. 
and with this, the, the turmoil that continues. And Lord, we just pray for them. Lord, particularly for your people in that place. We pray that you might sustain them, that you might comfort them and help them to be a great comfort and blessing to their neighbours and those around, that they might be able to share something of the hope of the Lord Jesus in these dark and difficult times. Father, we pray too for our brothers and sisters around the world who face uh, great persecution because of their love of you. Father, we know that this is something that we are to expect, but Lord, we do pray for those in, in places like uh, 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 parts of Africa and Lord, within uh, some of the, the, the nations where um, in the Middle East, Lord, we think of places like Afghanistan and Pakistan, even parts of India, Lord, where to own the name of the Lord Jesus can be a sentence of death. Father, we pray for them that you would continue to help them to stand firm. Lord, we pray that you would protect them and watch over them, we ask. And Father, we pray for ourselves. We pray that as we turn to your words in a moment, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. Please, by your Holy Spirit, please encourage us, convict us, and help us to become more like the Lord Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, before we, um, we uh, look at the, the word together, we're going to sing once more. And we're going to sing this song from the breaking of the dawn. And the last verse says this, Hope that lifts me from despair, love that casts out every fear, as I stand on every promise of your word. Let's sing and remember the great promises that we have in God's word. Let's stand and sing together. I'm 
stand on every promise of your word. And you promise to complete every work begun in me. So I'll stand on every promise of your word. Oh, that lifts me from despair. Love that casts out everything. As I stand on every promise of your word. Not For the Comforter has Excellent. Well, do turn back. We've got a Bible to uh, Micah, chapter 5, and we'll be concentrating on the first five verses. Um, let me ask you this question. Can you imagine living without hope? Can you imagine living without hope? Maybe uh, you might say, well, I, I don't need to imagine. Maybe, maybe some of us here have experienced what that's like. Uh, it has been said that a human can live about 40 days without food, about three days without water, and about eight minutes, apparently, without air. That seems quite a lot. But this person says, but only one second without hope. Now, that might be an exaggeration, but you get the point it makes. It's a valid point, isn't it? We need hope. And yet we live in times when hope seems to be in short supply. It's really striking as we look at the news, we see how the, all the dark things have been happening, lots of bad things have been happening in the past year. And people are very fearful for the future. Even young people seem to lack hope. Uh, there are two types of hope. Uh, the dictionary definition for hope is a feeling of expectation, a desire or wish for a certain thing to happen. Oh, I hope that, I'm, that England are going to win the World Cup might, be one of your, might have been one of your hopes. But the Bible definition of hope is a different one. It's an expectation with certainty that God will do what he has said. And it's obvious the difference, isn't it? There's many things we hope for that are just wishful thinking. But there is hope in the Bible that we can be certain of that God will do what he said. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning, the encouragement of Micah 5 is though it's set in a, in a dark time, really a very dark time, uh, in the time of the, um, the, the, the God's people in the Old Testament, it's a time of ungodliness and, and disaster is about to happen. And in the midst of the darkness, there is this bright light of hope that shines. Hope in a faithful God. And we will see that there is hope amongst the great vulnerability that they had of true peace and security. Now, of course, these are words that uh, we will recognize, I'm sure are familiar to us from uh, those services of nine lessons and carols. But it, I think it would be true to say that apart from those uh, carol services, Micah is probably not a book we are overly familiar with. Micah was one of the four great 8th century BC prophets. 
and I, I won't ask you to name, I'm going to tell you the other name of the other three, because <laughs> um, I'm not sure I would have known this, but the others were Hosea, Amos, and Isaiah. So those four were around at the same sort of time. And, and in Micah's day, God's people, Israel in the north and Judah in the south, had both turned away from God. Instead of being distinct shining lights, showing the world what it meant to love and trust the true and living God. Well, they just become like all the other nations around them. And they built altars and idols of false gods and were worshipping them. The rich exploited the poor. The powerful took whatever they pleased, defrauding others of even their homes. A dishonest practices prevailed everywhere. Her leaders and priests didn't judge or teach what was right, but they taught and judged according to what bribes they received and who was paying them. Even prophets were only telling people what they wanted to hear. Uh, Micah, there's a great verse in chapter 2, with, with heavy irony, he tells them, if a liar and deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer. Well, he would be just the prophet for this people. But Micah's message is not a comfortable one at all because he tells them that this will not go unpunished. God is planning disaster from them, a disaster from which they cannot save themselves. Jerusalem will be ploughed like a field. It will become a heap of rubble. And, and chapter 5 that we read starts with a description of those dark days. It speaks about the city being besieged and its ruler humiliated. The rod, the rod is a symbol of authority and it says it will be snatched from the king of Israel and it will be used to strike him. And you can read about how that was fulfilled in, in the book of Kings. And it's in this context that we find the verses that we are most familiar with. And, and uh, this morning, as we look at these familiar verses that we hear every Christmas, uh, there's three things that I would like us to see. And the first one is this. Uh, what we will see is greatness comes from the place of humility. And therefore we see that Christmas reminds us that God delights to bestow significance upon the insignificant. He delights to bestow significance upon the insignificant. Well, let's uh, look again at verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Or, as other versions put it, from days of eternity. God was going to provide a ruler for his people, not just another in the line of failed kings of Israel and Judah. A special king. And what was special about this king? Did you notice that? God says, as he speaks through the prophet uh, uh, Micah, he promises that this king will come for me. This is going to be God's king. But he's also going to be one whose origins are from ancient times, or as I said, other versions say, from days of eternity. These are the words that are used elsewhere in the Old Testament to describe God himself, the one who has no beginning and no end. This is the one that John speaks about at the beginning of his gospel. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Here is God promising his king, the Messiah. And yet he's to come out of a place that Micah says is scarcely worth counting among the clans of Judah. It's not just a, a, a small place, but in in Micah's day, a totally insignificant place, the least of places. Uh, and, and we, of course, know the Christmas story. 
But I wonder what those who listened to Micah thought. I suspect like the wise men, they must have thought God's king should be born in somewhere far more impressive. Surely somewhere like the center of political and military power. Maybe a, a, a great fortress. Somewhere like Jerusalem. But no, the most insignificant place was the one chosen to bring forth the most preeminent person. Bethlehem, unlikely and unimpressive. And actually, isn't that like so much of the nativity story and the life of the Lord Jesus? Jesus born to an unmarried girl from Nazareth, a town, a northern town that was derided. Do you remember? I think it was Nathaniel said, wasn't it? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's what they thought about that place. He was born in a stable laid in an animal's feeding trough and welcomed into the world by shepherds who themselves were held in low esteem in their, in their day. And at near the end of his time on earth, we don't find him on a throne being worshipped by multitudes, but on a cross, a cruel form of execution, mock, despised, and humiliated. You know, in fact, so much of what God does can look to many people as very unimpressive. But if we look again, we see that greatness comes from the place of humility. God works with the humble, but he opposes the proud. He lifts up the humble in order to magnify his grace and mercy. And in choosing Bethlehem over Jerusalem, God illustrates the true nature of the good news that comes through Jesus. When we, If you think about uh, the other world religions and even the sort of secular philosophy that we, we hear uh, today, uh, they, they appeal to the strong. Uh, they appeal to those, to, to people to strive to pull themselves up to the mark, to recognise their inner strength, to achieve whatever their dreams may be. Uh, there is that sense, well, you need to do it and you can do it. But Jesus, in contrast, says, I have not come for the strong. I haven't come for the healthy, but for the sick. Not for those who think they're already good enough or could be good enough, but those who recognize they are weak, that they are sinners and all they can cry out for is mercy. Jesus alone says, I will save you, not by what you do, but through what I have done. However much we've messed up, if we admit it and repent, Jesus offers forgiveness and acceptance into his family. You see, God delights to work in the lives of people like that, the weak and the lowly, the humble. God chose insignificant Bethlehem to be the birthplace of his dear son. So there would be no room for boasting. No one could say, of course, God set his favour on Bethlehem. Look at how fantastic it was. Look at all it has achieved. And it's the same for us in the church today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, it says this. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. I think it's very tempting and easy for us to think that to be really effective, God's work needs charismatic, highly gifted individuals. And, and then we look at ourselves and, and we just feel so dull and inadequate. But you know, God 
chooses the unlikely. He chooses the unimpressive. Even the people that no one gives a second thought about to do his work, to shame the wise and the strong. Isn't that our experience too for many of us? Those that perhaps uh, first of all told us the gospel. They may not have been uh, some big name. They were just ordinary people. Sinners who had found the joy of knowing the Lord Jesus for themselves. Those who have helped us to keep on loving the Lord Jesus. So often it's just ordinary people, a friend, a parent, perhaps a brother or sister, someone who just comes alongside us and gives us that word of encouragement. And that's how God delights to work through people who may not look impressive, no, impressive. But God is not impressed by our bigness. Rather, he's choice, he chooses the lowly so that it might magnify his mercy and power. So we see that God chooses the lowly. Uh, but now, secondly, we see that God is sovereign over everything. Uh, and therefore, Christmas reminds us, even in the darkest times, we can be certain that God will keep every promise. Uh, we saw already uh, that the people of Israel are in a very low point uh, and things are about to get worse. Uh, I wonder how the faithful remnant of God's people must have been wondering how God was ever going to fulfill the great promises he had made to them. Uh, they knew the promises from the Old Testament right back from Genesis 3 when God said, that the one would come who would uh, crush the head of the serpent. And there was the promises that one day a righteous branch of David would be raised, a king who would reign wisely and do what is just, whose kingdom would never end. But just at the moment when Israel is sinking toward oblivion, the northern kingdom has already been destroyed and the southern kingdom is coming under God's judgment. God in his kindness reasserts the certainty of his promise. And there's no doubt about the meaning and understanding of this prophecy. I mean, some 700 years later, we know very well, don't we, that the chief priests and the teachers of the law in Jerusalem they didn't hesitate when they were asked where the Christ was to be born. Well, they, they looked at the scriptures and they said, well, it's clear. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. It was clear. Now, of course, Jesus' mother, Mary, and his adoptive father, Joseph, were both descendants of David. But they lived miles away from Bethlehem right up in the north, as we've said, in Nazareth, where Joseph was a carpenter. And for but one thing, Jesus would have been born in Nazareth. As we, again, the familiar words to us, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. That was the only reason that they went to Bethlehem. Caesar Augustus, I'm sure for no reason than to satisfy his own whim and purposes, called a census. And he decided, because he could, in order to affect the census, all the Jews should each go back to their particular ancestral towns, family towns and villages. So Mary and Joseph had to go to Bethlehem. They had no choice. They were compelled <coughs> by the decree of the emperor. Even Mary, in her heavenly pregnant condition, had to go. Now, of course, Caesar Augustus didn't know about her situation or others in a similar situation, and I sus suspect he didn't care. No doubt he felt entitled to exercise his power over these kingdoms that they had conquered. So, Caesar seems, it seems, to all the world like 
this Caesar Augustus is the one who is all-powerful. Uh, Roman emperors uh, like Caesar Augustus were even prone to claiming for themselves the powers of deity. deity. They called on people to worship them. But what we see here is that in spite of how things looked, actually, it's God who is ultimately in control over all these things, even over these great human rulers and international affairs. God's promise made over 700 years before is fulfilled through the actions of a pagan emperor of an empire that in Micah's day did not even exist. And I think this should be a great encouragement to us. As we look out and we look around us, maybe we also fear, are fearful and, fear that, and feel that those who oppose God are the ones with power and influence in our country and in our world. They are the voices that are heard. But God encourages us to look beyond the apparent and to see that our God is the one who is still seated on the throne. And he is able to keep every last detail of every promise. We make promises, don't we, that we can't, we don't keep. We've all done it. Particularly we have children, my children are always reminding me if I've promised something and I don't deliver, then they are very good at reminding me of it. And sometimes it's because I forget. Sometimes it's because I've changed my mind. And sometimes it's because we are unable. But the Lord our God who reigns is wonderfully not like us. His sovereignty is awesome. He is unchanging. And his, such is his power that even when humans do what is meant for harm, he is able through those same acts to bring about his good purposes and the fulfilment of his promises, both for his glory and for the good of us as his people. So Christmas reminds us that we can trust in every promise of his word. And then finally, Christmas reminds us there is security and peace in the fold of God's shepherd king. In verse 4, Micah, Micah tells us something more about the nature of this promised ruler. Let's have a look at verse 4. It says, He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. When people are looking for a position of leadership, or when politicians seek highest office, they are sometimes asked, what type of leader will you be? What type of leader will you be? Well, I don't remember anyone like that saying, I will be like a shepherd. But that's God's type of ruler. Uh, of course, shepherding in the Middle East was very different from the type we are familiar with. There's no sheepdogs charging around to round up the sheep. Instead, the shepherd lives among his flock. He guides them, he protects them, he knows each one of them, and they know him. And this shepherd king that God promises here, we are told that he will stand. In other words, he's not passive. He's not lying around waiting to be served. He is actively looking to feed and protect and care for the flock. And we're also told he doesn't lack any power, for it is in the strength of the Lord, the omnipotent, all-powerful creator, that he watches over them. Nothing is going to hinder his good intentions. And God's shepherd's king has supremacy. But it's the superiority of a wise and tender shepherd over his needy and loving flock. 
He, he commands and receives obedience. But it's the willing obedience of those uh, of sheep who know that they are well cared for, that they are loved. And therefore their obedience is given joyfully to their beloved shepherd whose voice they know so well. And of course, as we thought earlier with the children, Jesus is that shepherd. He is the good shepherd. He is good. How beautiful the Lord Jesus is when we think about his rule and the way that he leads compared with so many human leaders that we, we, we know of and encounter. How beautiful he is. How attractive is his reign and his rule. And therefore how good it is to live under his rule. Well, verse 4 tells us two more things that, uh, <clears throat> that we can have through God's promised ruler, through this promised shepherd king. And that is security and peace. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. Within the fold of the shepherd king, Absolute security is assured. Uh, nowhere that those who are in that fold, nowhere they go, will be unsafe. Because his rule will be a universal one. They will reach to every part of the world. He is in complete control. And therefore those who are in his fold are completely secure. Jesus, the good shepherd, has defeated the enemies, the great enemies of his people. He's defeated sin and Satan and death. And therefore we can know what it is to be completely secure. I guess the problem is that often perhaps we don't feel that. Doubts come into our minds and we don't perhaps recognize that security that we have. I think there's a, a, a great hymn that reminds us just how secure we are. Um, that hymn that says, when I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. Christ will hold me fast. Bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. He will hold me up fast, for my Saviour loves me so. He will hold me fast. It's a great comfort for us to know that we have true security in the Lord Jesus. But I think there is also a, a challenge for us here as well. Do we live as those who know that security? Uh, we know very well how people behave when they feel insecure. If we feel insecure, then we are tempted to, to boast about uh, and, and perhaps big up ourselves and tell people about our list of achievements. Vulnerable leaders tend to blame others for failure. But if we love and follow the Lord Jesus, we have a great security that the world doesn't know. And shouldn't that mark us out as distinctive in the way that we live. I wonder, do those we live and work with, or, or even lead, whether that's in the home or in the work situation, do they see the difference that that great assurance we have in Christ makes to us, that our security is not in what we have done, but what, uh, what Christ has done for us. Well, Christmas reminds us of the true safety and security that we have in the Lord Jesus, but it also reminds us of the peace that he brings. And uh, in those verses it says, he will be their peace. Uh, John F. Kennedy once said, what kind of peace do we seek? Not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave. I'm talking about genuine peace. 
the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, the, the kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and to build a better life for their children. Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, but peace for all time. Well, it was a great speech. But I wonder, uh, JFK had his idea of what sort of peace he, he wanted, he dreamed of. But what sort of peace does Jesus bring? Is it an inner peace that finally sets us free from inner turmoil? Is it peace within families? We will need that probably this Christmas time. Is it peace amongst those who have fallen out with one another or peace among the nations? Well, I think the answer is yes. The peace Jesus brings will surely ultimately impact on all of these. But actually, Jesus brings a much greater peace. It is a peace which without Without it, all other peace between men and nations that JFK dreamed of will be impossible. And that peace is peace with God. Maybe we don't like to think of it like this, but the truth is, from God's perspective, there is a war. A war between mankind and himself. The very people that he created in his own image who've rebelled against him and rejected his loving rule over their lives. And without peace in this conflict, well, one day, there will be a reckoning and they have to face his wrath and condemnation. And that's why we need Jesus, for he alone is able to be our peace. The one who laid down his life for his sheep. And as he did that on the cross, he paid the price. He bore God's wrath for our rebellion. So we do not need to do so. I wonder, do you have peace with God this morning? Do you have peace with God? That's the most important peace we can have or that we need to have. And to know this peace, we start by admitting that conflict between us and our maker. Admitting that it's our fault that we've lived for ourselves and we've written the one we owe our lives and every good thing. Well, we've written him out of the script of our lives. And it, but the wonderful thing is that if we admit that and if we ask him to forgive us, and to make Jesus' death count for us, he will do that. He will wonderfully forgive us, and instead of being his enemies, he welcomes us into his family, into the fold, where we can enjoy both peace and security. That is the wonderful good news, that Jesus is our peace. But as we finish, there is also a challenge, I think, here as well. If you know that peace with God, can I ask you, are you a peacemaker? Uh, let me just quote something from uh, the American pastor, Tim Keller. He said, peacemakers are people who, through making peace with God, have finally learned to admit flaws and weaknesses, how to surrender their pride, how to love without the need to control every situation. They have peace with God that enables them to go and make peace with others. I think it's very striking in the letter that James writes in the New Testament that wisdom that comes from heaven is described as first of all pure and then peace loving. Are we those who are wise who seek, as we have received, peace with God, who share peace and seek to make peace with others, who have that heavenly wisdom that in what we do, as we seek to help people in relationships where things have broken down, are we peace 
loving people. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Well, there we have it. Through Micah, we've seen that Christmas reminds us that God delights to bestow significance upon the insignificant. That even in the darkest times, we can be certain that God will keep every promise. And finally, we've seen there is security and peace in the fold of God's shepherd's king. Amen. Amen. Well, we are going to uh, close our time by singing of that little town of Bethlehem. So, uh, and to remember, as, as the, the carol reminds us, that the Lord Jesus still receives the meek, those who recognize their need of him, and he will willingly come into our hearts. So let's stand and sing of oh, oh, this, this well-known carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we have learned from Micah. We thank you that you delight to use the lowly and the humble. And we thank you that we can trust in you in each and every situation. Uh, that we find, that we can trust in your promises, that we know you will never let us down. And Father, we thank you for the security and peace that we have. If we trust in the Lord Jesus, please help us. As we go into another week, please help us to be those who live knowing that they, we are secure in Christ. Please help us to be peacemakers in the world around us, 
to those that we meet and work and live amongst, we pray. Please help us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.